Okay, thank you very much, Ian, and thanks very much to Derek for inviting me here. It's given me a good excuse for a trip home, so much appreciated. So um, I want to talk um, about a different jurisdiction. I think the title gives it away, and I want to talk about three particular points of view here. First of all, I want to talk about, give you some introduction, a little bit of background to local government in Northern Ireland. Secondly, I want to focus on a fairly recent review of local government called the Review of Public Administration, which was wider than local government, but local government featured prominently in it. And then thirdly and finally, I want to talk about whether or not there's an appetite for a directly elected mayor in Northern Ireland local councils. So just by way of context, okay, page down. Um, a little, a very little bit of, of background here. Um, the local government system in Northern Ireland is really rooted in the 1898 Local Government Ireland Act. And in that act, some of you will probably know this better than I do, uh, there was essentially a two-tier system, a county council system and a lower tier of urban and rural councils. In that structure, there were basically six very large towns, Dublin, Cork, Cities, Limerick, Waterford, Belfast and Derry. Um, that continued as a system of local government. I'm skating over history uh, fairly superficially here until the establishment of, of the Free State. And at that point, from that point onwards in the Northern Ireland co context of the six counties, we saw uh, the emergence of uh, unionist hegemony. We saw um, a dominance of the local government sector by the unionist parties, the abolition of um, proportional representation, all of the kind of historical facts that we now know, gerrymandering of boundaries, um, limitations on voting rights and so on. That system continued right up until the 1960s, and as you will know, local government was a major source of contention around the whole civil rights movement in Northern Ireland. So pressures for reform came about in the 1960s. In part, those were political pressures around discrimination in local government in, in Northern Ireland, particularly around the whole issue of housing. But actually, there were other factors which contributed fairly significantly to the reform process. And some of those had to do with what A was talking about earlier, function and forms. We had a very large number of local authorities for a very small population, something like 73 local authorities with very small uh, electoral bases, uh, and also very limited finance to, to deal with their functions. So those both political and functional press pressures conspired to lead to the, the major reform of local government under the McCrory report. And McCrory uh, essentially advised that we should have a two-tier system of local government, a regional and a local tier. He recommended that the regional tier would have uh, fairly significant powers, but, but also that local government will have a, would have a fairly strong role. The Findings of McCrory were never fully implemented because they were overtaken by what's uh, euphemistically referred to as the Troubles. Um, so by the early 1970s, local government as a functional tier was relegated to a fairly insignificant role, sometimes referred to as having roles of baths, bins, births and burials. Uh, and that label has kind of stuck with local government in, in Northern Ireland rather, rather unfortunately. So what we ended up with by the 1970s was 26 fairly small district councils with fairly limited responsibility. So from, 19, from 1973 onwards we had 26 councils. Those councils, despite the fact that they had fairly limited functions, some of them were quite innovative in terms of the things that they tried to do with local government. So you had some, some very energetic, entrepreneurial uh, chief executives who pushed the boundaries of their powers to ensure that local representation and, and local decision making 
meant a lot more than just the limited functions which they have. A big landmark in the history of local government was the election of Sinn Féin councillors to, to the local government forum in 1985. We had 59 councillors, part of the Sinn Féin strategy, so-called the ballot box and, and Armalite. Um, so they, they contested seats in the 1985 election. They were successful. The upshot of all of that was major disruption in council chambers as a result of uh, their presence. Their presence, unionists got into all kinds of tactics, including fisty cuffs on occasion, walking out of council chambers, refusing to acknowledge them, etc. Having said all of that, uh, that disruption did die down, and 1989 marked a fairly uh, important turning point in local government. Some writers have linked it to the fact that the Enniskillen bombing took place at that particular date and had a salutary effect in terms of the, roles, the role that councils could play in creating some kind of calm in, in the midst of major political turmoil. What actually happened beyond that point was uh, what's referred to in the literature as responsibility sharing rather than power sharing. Responsibility sharing was a bit of a euphemism that unionists could live with, whereas if you used the word power sharing, I think that was politically emotive. <coughs> and ultimately, then, we reached a stage of um, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement of 1998. So I've skated over lots of that. But the upshot of that was that alongside having a political agreement in 1998, we had devolution in December 1999 as part of the wider G GB or UK agenda of devolution. Specifically in terms of what that meant for local government, there was a recognition amongst our locally elected representatives that with devolution should come a re-look, a re-examination of the role of local government. And in 2002, they set up a fairly major review called the Review of Public Administration, the role of which was to review existing arrangements for accountability, administration and delivery of public services. So this was billed by our local, locally elected representatives as a, a kind of a clean sweep of, a clean sweep examination of all of the functions of governance in Northern Ireland. The problem, however, was that it excluded all of the major government departments because our ministerial system was predicated on ministers from all across, of the, all across the executive uh, being given ministerial portfolios. If those were to change, then it would upset the power-sharing apple cart, so to speak. So from its very outset, the review of public administration really became a review of some, some non-departmental public bodies and local government. Alongside that, having set it up in 2002, we ran into major difficulties over devolution. Our devolved assembly in Stormont was uh, suspended four times during the period of uh, 1999 and 2004, at which point our Secretary of State stepped in and said we're going to have direct rule. So the time that had been allocated for this major review of our public sector was actually uh, significantly influenced by the wider political agenda. At that stage, there was lots of toing and froing over whether Sinn Féin had decommissioned arms or not, and that led ultimately, as I said, to the suspension of devolution. Ultimately, we did not get a devolved assembly back in any significant format until 2007, post the St Andrews Agreement. In the meantime, their direct rule ministers had said that they were going to take on board the review of public administration and to reorganise local government. One of the things that they attempted to do during that period was they attempted to bait our local politicians, B-A-I-T, our local politicians, uh, back into devolved uh, responsibilities by saying, if you do not take on the functions of the review of public administration, we will do this and we will impose our solutions on you. Some of those solutions that they were suggesting were quite unpalatable. So in part, I think the Review of Public Administration was responsible in part for a restoration of our devolved functions. During that time, the whole rhetoric was, it was interesting to listen to A's presentation about the role, if you like, of local government vis-a-vis vis -vis central government. 
During that period, there was widespread debate around strengthening local government that we needed, given its history from 1972, that we needed a very strong forum as a counterbalance to Stormont. So there was lots of talk and rhetoric about the promise of strong local government mm -hmm. on the review of public administration. So having started out the review of public administration in 2002, it was not until 2015, some 13 years later, that we actually got uh, the result of that. And the result of that, in my opinion, was hugely disappointing. So 26 of our local authorities were reduced to 11 and have been operational from the 1st of uh, April 2015. So I don't expect you to read this long list, but simply to note that if the promise was for strong local government, these two columns show what local government currently is responsible for, and probably more importantly, what they are not responsible for, and I think this feeds into the discussion as to whether or not we should consider directly elected mayors. So the strong, so-called strong local government that we now have as things like waste disposal, local development planning, building control, leisure services, street cleaning, etc. They give local government statutory power of community planning, in my opinion, as a SOP to get not, not uh, devolving more significant powers to them. This community planning function is where local authorities have the power to call to account central government bodies in practice. Uh, because it's relatively new, we've yet to see whether that is true. But more importantly here, I think it's import it, it is useful to look at powers which local authorities do not have. They do not have powers of education, health or personal social services, roads, fire, police, transport, public housing, etc. So the big substantive local government powers here are all sit with our uh, central government in Westminster. So if, if we think of that as kind of the functional responsibilities associated with local government, I just want to give you an idea of size here. So the largest local, authorities on, local authority under the new configuration is Belfast City Council with a population of 336,000. The smallest one is Fermanagh and Oma with a population of 115,000. So still relatively small <coughs> scale here. Um, total spend by local government is about 790 million, about 350 pounds per capita. Most of that is raised through our local rates. But if you set uh, the local government budget within our over public, over, overall public expenditure, so our Northern Ireland executive spends 10.3 billion pounds, our local government sector spends 780 million. So the amount of public expenditure consumed by our local government is 7.7% of the public purse. So still, despite the rhetoric of very strong local government, our local government system is very weak. So um, one of the things I think that's useful just in terms of linking all of this into discussions about directly elected mayors is how all of this would play out in our local political system. One of the success stories of local government, which it isn't given, in my opinion, sufficient credit for, is that local government were doing responsibility stroke power sharing long before we had a power sharing executive instalment. So in some ways, our local councillors led the way towards acceptance of power sharing as a political way forward. And you will see, I just took these figures uh, recently, the new mayors, chairs were elected in June. You will see from the new 11 local authorities that 10 of the 11, 11 are responsibility sharing or power sharing. So you have a split between DUP, Sinn Féin, DUP, SDLP, etc. The only council on that list is Mid and East Antrim, which is a DUP mayor and UUP deputy mayor. So you can see the um, operationalisation of power sharing, responsibility sharing in our new councils. And I think that is a continuation of some of the things that, yeah, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yep. Okay. So very quickly, just to complete this and link it into the 
issue of, of directly ele elected mayors. I think it is the case that our chairs and mayors have embedded the principle of power sharing. There certainly is a potency of the, uh, our symbolism around being the function, w without it being functionally significant, there's uh, significant symbolism around the mayor's role and the fact that that operationalizes power sharing. I think there's a particular difficulty if we were to, to replace uh, the system that we have with a directly elected mayor because it could embed the whole uh, notion of majoritarianism. Once again, a recent DUP, of Der a DUP mayor of Derry said that she would probably be the last unionist mayor of Derry if it were to move to become a directly uh, elected mayor, mayor, mayor uh, if she was to become uh, a directly elected mayor. So part of the uh, agenda moving forward in our local government has been to protect that issue of responsibility sharing. So for the new councils, this piece of legislation uh, protects the issue of sharing responsibility. So just a, a few quick final comments. And it's been raised earlier, some of our cities, Belfast City Council in particular, feels that it has very ambitious plans for physical, economic and community regeneration, and that Stormont cannot drive that. It needs the profile of a mayor in a city to drive that. Yet we see um, in the GB context that scale of these local authority collaborations matter. I mean, Collins' uh, reference to Manchester combined authority as 1.8 million people is the size of Northern Ireland. So I, I guess from if one were to look at that in the Northern Ireland context, uh, could uh, Stormont be our northern powerhouse here rather than 11 smallish <coughs> district councils? And the other uh, thing about uh, having a directly elected mayor in a city like Belfast is there's a nervousness about local government in Northern Ireland still. I mean, if you think, if you remember the issue in two, December 2012 where um, there was a big uh, debate fallout from the issue of raising the unionist flag over Belfast City Council, that created widespread political mayhem in the city. So there's still a nervousness that councils will revert to type here. Um, and I think you know, that's, that may well be an issue around um, um, whether we move to directly elected mayors. So finally, um, Ian has obviously put a jinx on my final slide. <laughs> but finally, I just want to make a couple of uh, final comments. Uh, directly elected mayors is not an agenda item on the new councils here. They're so preoccupied with bedding in, they're so nervous about the consequences of that. I think scale and powers is a particular factor in terms of whether we would move to directly elected mayors, and we don't have either of those to any extent. I think there is this nervousness around power sharing. I also think that outside of Belfast City Council, there's nothing akin to metropolitan government in the, UK, uh, in the UK or in the Republic of Ireland. And local government, just to make Aid's point, uh, Aid's point uh, further, local government in Northern Ireland continues to be the poor relation of Stormont. Thank you.